All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Bitter Dregs PGCon 2019. I think this is the last session, right? So thanks for hanging in there. Hope it's worth it. Me too. I want to get out of here alive. <laughs> We're here to talk about a fun topic. And um, I like to start off sometimes my talks without prologue. But then you might say, well, you've already been prologuing it enough, so get to it. Okay. Someone tell me what that is. I wish it was, yeah. <laughs> stream. stream, the gentleman says. Now, let me ask you this, sir. You say it's a stream. How do you know it's not a pond? Uh, it appears to be flowing. Ah, yeah. flowing. But it's a snapshot. It's not, there's no motion. Uh, at this point. But you're saying that you do see motion there, or implied motion. Implied and you also mentioned uh, flow, and that kind of implies. Narrow and long. Right. Um, the rocks are rounded. Yeah, so, yeah, it is a stream. And what's interesting about this, this is a, this is a snapshot that I took. Um, and uh, if I was to have come back to this same scene, like a few hours later, do the same shot, it probably would have looked pretty much identical. Big difference. Would the water have been the same? No, that water would have been long gone. Down the stream, maybe into a data lake, who knows. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this a little bit. And uh, the name of this talk is Streaming Analytics with PostgreSQL. I don't know if it's called Postgres or do they put the QL on it anymore? Yeah? yeah? Can I just say Postgres, is that good enough? Okay. Oh, he did. Yes. Great, that's awesome. Thank you. So this is going to be checked to come get me for my kids. Oh, okay, good. Well, thanks for following up on it. Yeah, and um, <coughs> here we are at PGCon 2019. I'm CB Bon. Just a little bit about me. I, I worked for Etsy for about 11 years. I left at the end of last year. Couldn't handle it anymore. Or maybe they couldn't handle me. It works both ways. Uh, yeah, when I started there, we were doing all our production data in, in Postgres, and that's how I got into coming to PGCon way back. Then, then uh, got into the whole analytics thing. We brought Vertica in. That's been a big success. And then I got interested in streaming analytics, which introduced me to Pipeline DB, which is what we're going to talk about today, and some other things. Okay, so. What is streaming analytics? We're going to talk about that. So streaming analytics is analytics that's done on a stream, and that makes perfect sense to me. But let me expound on it a little bit more. You've got data that's in motion, and you want to do queries about that data that's in motion. That's different than doing queries on a big vat of data. Um, and I've got a graphic later to show that. We're going to talk about two Postgres-derived Streaming analytics databases. The first one is Pipeline DB. It's been around for a while. And there's some developments with that, which I'll touch on later. And then there's a new guy, Timescale DB, that you might have heard about, but they just released about two weeks ago, they released a continuous aggregation feature. Okay? And that's kind of uh, a streaming analytics deal. We'll talk about that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about KSQL, because that plays into this whole deal. Okay, data stream versus data lake. You know, we use these terms a lot. For some reason, someone got a big to-do about water-based analogies, and so they did this. So data lake, I'm from San Francisco. We got like a homeless population, so it's always in my mind, so I'm kind of like using that as a metaphor, as an analogy. Data lake is like a long-term residency hotel, okay? It's like Hotel California or the Roach Motel, where the data checks in and it never checks out, okay? That's a permanent long-term store. Data stream is transient data. It's just passing through, very much in the moment. It's all about insight into the here and now. OK, now streaming versus traditional databases, just to get a little more formal on this. A traditional database, its data is finite and it's stored. It has permanent endurance, supposedly. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Streaming database, the data is infinite because it keeps on going along. It's like that great old tune, Old Man River, just keeps rolling along. And it's unbounded because it starts somewhere up there and it ends somewhere down there. There's a conundrum 
as there often are with these data type things. You can have, there's three things. You have high throughput, you have a small internal storage, you can have 100% accurate aggregation results. And you get to pick two of the three. You can't have them all. And just to give you some examples of what streaming analytics can do for you, near real-time monitoring. Imagine, you know, you've got uh, response times from your website, HTTP pages, um, and it's coming through your, your data pipeline there, and you want to know, gee, what's the response uh, over the past hour of these, um, of these web pages? So you could use streaming analytics to create uh, a grouping by the page, uh, giving the, you know, the average response time over the past hour. So that's very useful. Can't really do that in a traditional database because there's just the, you know, it takes too long to get the data there to look at. The query is possible, but the data is not there. Near, near real time stats. Now that's running totals, for example, page counts, conversion rates, sales. Now I told you I worked at Etsy and we've got sellers, and they always want to know, gee, you know, how many page views do I have? What's my sales for today? Well, it's really tough to get that back to them through traditional data store means, but you can do this really easily, as we'll talk about, in, a, in Pipeline DB. Because you can create a view, and you can group by the shop ID, and you can do a running total of how many views they've had, how many sales they've had, what the sum of that is. It's all good. And then A-B testing. A lot of us do A-B testing, and there's this cycle in A-B testing where the data, you know, you put out different paths for your through your site, right? And you try to look at, hey, uh, is it having any effect? Usually what happens is that data is captured in a click stream and somehow that makes it into a database that it can be analyzed. But there's a long cycle there. At Etsy, it took like the next day before we had that data to look at. And a lot of times you want to know something right away. I mean, you can imagine the horror that somebody has when they realize that the little switch they made to a sales page is cause, you know, a loss of $100,000. It'd sure be nice to know that in the moment, then have to wait till the next day. And it's all about increasing the velocity of making decisions. So much stuff that technology does is about speeding things up. I was thinking about this the other day, like uh, the mail, right? It used to be Pony Express, or it used to be by foot, then Pony Express, then train, planes. Now we got email. So that's all faster. Dating, you know, you used to have to take Ellie Mae to the county fair and you'd get a dress and all this stuff and you'd have to sit there at the picnic and say, God, I have to do all of this just to decide if I want to keep going on this here. Now, you know, you got these dating apps, swipe no, 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 hell no, and it's much faster, okay? So that's what this is all about. All right, big data analytics. This is kind of uh, the way things are out there. You've got your data sources, be they production data like Postgres, uh, you may have uh, clickstream data and so forth. It all gets piped in to this enterprise data warehouse. The purpose of this is to contain the totality of the data and maybe be a source of truth about that data. And the uses of this thing are to do analytics, historical reports, BI reports, and so forth. The tools to do those reports are usually like some type of OLAP database like Vertica or BigQuery if you're in the cloud with Google or uh, Redshift maybe in AWS, uh, and there's some other tools that can be used. And the challenges of all this is making sure that that data is potable and doesn't turn into data sludge. And I've included a handy little fill level site window there so that you could take a look at saying, hey, are we filling up this reservoir? Because one of the things about data is it just keeps growing. And if you run out of space, it's bad. And also, data sludge is like when your data gets really in a bad state. Maybe there's a lot of duplicates or it's just crummy data, and that tends to pile up, so you've got to manage that. Those are the challenges of that kind of system. But what we're going to talk about, this is, so tradi this is traditional analytics, right? You've got this big data store, you've got all this data, and you can use these uh, OLAP tools to get really fast aggregated results because of the way that data is stored. That's for a different uh, topic. Uh, but you'll see that the pipe going in there is labeled ETL flow, and um, in a way, the streaming analytics is all about doing analytics not on this big data vat, but on doing it on the pipe. 
let's talk about that pipeline. So you've got product databases, maybe Clickstream, maybe IoT, sorry for the handwriting. All that stuff's going into this data pipeline. This is relatively new, you know, to get data around. Um, it wasn't so much a problem years ago, but now all, you've got all these different sources of data and, and you, you want to be able to route it around your company uh, easily. And so that gave rise to a bunch of messaging systems like ActiveMQ and some other ones. And they were just so complicated and it was really easy to mess them up. And so I think it was at LinkedIn where Jay Kreps is the guy's name. He invented Kafka, right? And he basically dumbed down the whole message queue system. Uh, and but he wanted to make a, a product that really focused on what was important. Uh, and so he came up with Kafka. It's a robust data bus. It's used for data distribution, routing data around. You can do pub sub with other applications to get things in. And it can be used for near real-time data analytics if you've got the right tool to do that, like PipelineDB. The challenges here with um, Kafka and pay data pipelines in general are uh, the ordering of the data especially if you're in a sharded environment. You know, you may, want to have a, you may have a transaction that comes in to the pipeline uh, before a transaction that actually happened before it, okay? And uh, Kafka doesn't really take care of that issue. All it does is guarantee that uh, the order of the data flowing through the Kafka pipeline is as received, okay? Uh, that can be a problem when you're doing some analytics, but often it's not. You know, if you're doing a count, for example, uh, over the past hour, uh, it doesn't matter if one transaction came before another, you know, because they're, they're both counting that, that count. So it doesn't matter which you count first, right? But there's other examples where it may make a difference. All right, pipelines and streams. So we've got that event data flow that's happening in our data pipe. And then these streaming analytic databases, the way they work is they sort of tap into that and then the analytics happens in that separate database. It's getting fed the data. So that uh, database at the bottom there would be like pipeline DB. It's getting data fed to it uh, through this tap line. And then our user there is looking at that data. I'm not quite sure what he's seeing there. It could be a complete disaster or he's overjoyed. Don't know. Uh, we're going to talk about this tap line. And in pipeline DB, that's referred to as a stream very confusing term because stream is used all over the place, but they call it a stream, as we'll see. There's two types of streaming analytics, continuous aggregation and a sliding window. They both have really good uses, but they're separate. Let's talk about the continuous aggregation. You'll see that Time is moving to the left in this case, and data is moving through that pipe. So if we do a continuous aggregation, what we're doing is we're, we're setting a start point. You see where it says aggregation start. And then after a certain amount of time, we run a query against this, uh, for this data analytics uh, continuous aggregation. And that aggregation happens between, on the data that has occurred or flowed in, from the aggregation start to the time of the query. And you'll see the time of the first query there. So that, that gap right there is the, is the first query data, right? If we were to then repeat that query sometime further down the line, we'd have our second query data, which is going to include the first plus whatever new stuff's come along. Does that all make sense? That's continuous aggregation. That's useful for doing like running totals in sums, if you want to know, gee, you know, how many uh, hits are this, is this particular page getting? You know, you can set up an uh, analytic query where it's just going to be a continuous aggregation. It's going to start at some point. It's just going to keep counting forever. The other type is sliding window. This is, uh, this is interesting. And what this is, is if you look at your pipeline there, it's a section of that pipeline. And the, we're only doing an analytics on the data that's in that section at the time that we run the query, okay? So it's best to just uh, give an example of this. Uh, let's say we want a query that says, gee, you know, how many, um, how many hits did we have uh, in a 10-second window 10 minutes ago, 
So we set up this query, and what it does is it looks at this pipeline, and it goes back and it gets the data from ending 10 minutes ago and going back 10 seconds. So that data, that it then uh, does its analytics on that. Uh, and after that query is run, it's like the water that I showed you in the stream. You know, it's gone, right? Because this data just keeps on flowing. So, but this is actually good because if we want to get a history of performance, we can keep repeating this query as often as we want. You know, if we report, repeat this query every minute, then we're going to have eventually, after 60 minutes, we're going to have 60 results for this 10 second uh, window that's happening 10 minutes back, right? And out of that, we can build a nice little graph showing, hey, things are getting better or things are getting worse or they're just what they were. Does that make sense? Good. Uh, and yeah, so you got your post window and your pre window. And we're going to get into what pipeline DB is all about, but there's a real distinction between pre window and post window uh, because the pre window data hasn't been looked at yet. It's really important. And post window, we don't really care. And we'll talk about why that is. All right, pipeline DB, two key objects. There's a stream, and that's for data ingestion. And then there's a continuous view. That is a relation that you can build, which really describes the logic to apply to the stream. The stream, I kind of think of it like a catcher in baseball. He's just, the stream, he's just sitting there and he's got his glove up. But there's, he's not catching anything yet. You've got to pipe that data into the stream. You could do that through like a uh, standard input or other means. But setting up the stream is just setting up the, the pipe, so to speak, uh, to receive the data. And then the continuous view is a view that can draw off of the stream, which looks like a table. Okay? Um, and I told you before that you know, you've got this conundrum. You could pick two or three things. Pipeline has emphasized throughput and small data footprint over 100% accurate aggregation. Now you may say, well, what the hell good is it if it's not going to be 100% accurate? Well, we're going to talk about that because it's actually pretty accurate and you don't need it to be 100% accurate to actually get value. Brief little thing about the flow in Pipeline DB. You've got your data stream that's, that's like Kafka that is then going into Pipeline DB. The users create streams and continuous views in, in the SQL language. It's all done in SQL in Pipeline DB. And then that data stream, uh, you know, it's acted on by whatever stream has been created in Pipeline DB. And that's to, to the right, that's the stream. And then that stream feeds the continuous views, right? And then the end user gets to see the results of queries against that continuous view. And here's what's really awesome about it that a pipeline DB stream, for all intents and purposes, looks like a table. It's got fields just like a table, data types just like a table. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a table. And because it's like a table, you can do joins on that against other tables. This is really useful. If you've got streaming, you know, clickstream stuff coming through your data event pipeline, a lot of times that's got like a user ID, so you can track what a user has done through the site. But you don't have any context about that user. You don't know user 123 from user 456. Who the hell are they? What you want to do where you really get the value is when you join that factual data with dimensions. And those dimensions are what are sitting in your pipeline DB. After all, it's a Postgres database. Okay? So you may have a table there of users which tells you where they live, you know, how much money they make, how much have they spent. All those kind of things are useful for the people in the offices up above who are trying to work out the business angle of everything. They want to know these answers. And uh, being able to join uh, facts with dimensions, the big deal and Pipeline DB makes that happen. It's really useful. Okay, sorry about the crummy quality of this thing here, uh, but I thought I would just paste in what it looks like, uh, the definition, syntax definition for creating uh, a continuous view. So you can see, you, all you do is issue a statement, create continuous view, whatever the name is, as, and then your, your view query from 
the from items. And the from items are what's here. You can uh, do a stream name, table name, and then you can alias them. Uh, but this is how you can join a stream with a table. Um, so in this other example below, continuous view, um, CV shop transactions, uh, selecting shop ID and the count, that's a transaction count from my stream, and we're grouping by shop ID. So over time, every time we query that continuous view, we're going to get to that point in time what the reality is to that point in time. This is a continuous aggregation. So if we run it right now, it would say maybe for shop ID 123, it would say there's a count of 1,000. But then we wait a few seconds, run it again, and it may be up to 1,050. Keeps on going. And what you can do with these also is you can take the output of one of these queries against a view, and you can put it into a table. So you can maintain a history of that, and that's useful. You can then do analytics on that, right? You might say, well, I've got uh, a month's worth of uh, shops with their transaction counts. Uh, let's see who's on the ascendancy and who's, who's starting a flat line. You could do that kind of query. Uh, that would be interesting. Okay, so I told you about how uh, PipelineDB has decided to eschew 100% accuracy in their uh, aggregated queries. And for some things that's important, others not. And it breaks down into simple versus difficult aggregations. A simple aggregation is like a count or a sum because we don't have to maintain a totality of the data, right? Every time a count, a, a new um, a view of a page comes in, for example, let's say we have 10 so far, a new view comes in along the stream, we read that. All we do is add one to our count of 10. We don't have to care, keep all the past events for those. Uh, how we got to the 10 in the first place, we don't care. We only care about the total count. So to get that 100% accurate, we just add to it every time one comes along. Same with sum. If we're doing a sum of sales, you know, a sale comes along, we got $1,000. Next one comes along, oh, add $10 to that. We don't care about the past thing. We just care about the aggregation of that point and that it's accurate going forward, we get that. Now let's talk about the tough stuff. Select distinct, select count distinct, or even median. Those are all tough ones because you've got to have the totality of the data, right? You've got to know what, what there is. Like for median, you've got to know the whole thing in order to be able to place where, what the median is. So, wait a minute. What Pipeline boasts about is, hey, we analyze the data and then we throw it away. We, we process the stream and then we throw away that data just as quick as we can. And that's how they get the low data footprint, right? They don't want to store data. I mean, we're talking billions and billions of bytes, trillions of bytes. It just keeps coming and coming. And you can't store that stuff. Otherwise, you're just going to blow up everything. So what they rightly decided, I think, is, hey, let's just process the data as quickly as we can and get then just bit bucket the, 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 the data. We don't care about it anymore. And then someone said, well, what about like median, man? What are we going to do? Okay. Oh. So what they do is they make use of Postgres aggregate functions. You all heard of those? This is a feature in, in Postgres. You can create a, comp uh, a function. And what it does, essentially, is you can tell Postgres, hey, for this, for this analytic function, here's how I want you to handle the marginal data that's coming in. Okay? For like count, the aggregate function is just take what I've got and add to it. Add one to it. Boom. So every time a uh, count happens, that's what's happening. It calls this uh, aggregate function that's bound to the count function. And all it says is, OK, OK, take the total and add one to it. Boom, easy. Same with sum, except it's just adding the, the numeric value there. Uh, for distinct, it uses uh, a little more complex. It uses a thing called a bloom filter. And bloom filters are uh, this kind of kind of a comb-like structure that allows you to quickly establish whether something has presence or not, if it's in the data set or not. Okay? Uh, and it could do that really, really quickly, and that's important. Uh, and that's how it, it could do select distinct. What it does is it says, oh, it checks the bloom filter. Hey, I got this new, this new guy right here. Does this, is this guy in the set already? Well, it doesn't want to go through the whole count, through the whole thing. You may have billions of these things. You don't want to count through the whole thing. Is there? No. Is it there? No. 
you want to be able to say with ass assuredness really quickly, have I already accounted for this guy? And the balloon filter can do that really, really quickly. So that is what that's all about. And then for select count distinct, there's a thing called hyperlog log. Okay? Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, it's a statistical thing. Um, and count distinct with that, I think, uh, I didn't put it in here, but I think that they say it's like 99.5% accurate, okay? Uh, even on really big data sets. And uh, I told you before that, you know, okay, so they're not getting 100% accuracy on some uh, aggregate functions, but you have to ask yourself, is 99 point whatever percent, is that acceptable? as an answer when I'm dealing with this stuff. Remember, we're not using this to generate financial reports to give to the IRS, okay? We're using this just to get insights into the business. That's really what data analytics on streams is all about. Uh, and so the question is, is 99 point whatever percent, uh, is that a good enough number to point you in the right direction of where you want to go? In most cases, the answer is probably yes. There may be some cases where it's not and then you'll have some decisions to make. But anyway, that's how it does this. And Pipeline DB has spent a lot of time building out a ton of these functions. If you go to the Pipeline DB site, you'll see that uh, just about all of the analytic functions uh, that would need the totality of the data as occurs in Postgres itself, uh, they've written uh, aggregate functions in order to do approximations that are, that are highly accurate. So that's really, really good. Okay, I put this in here just for some key features. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, one thing that this came out, of, the whole continuous view thing came out of some research at Berkeley. And interestingly enough, and there's some, there's some high-ranking, highly paid Postgres guys here who could tell me this for sure, but <clears throat> I understand that the continuous view construct is up for consideration to be added to the SQL standard. Anybody have any info on that? Who said that? There you go. Okay. Yeah, that is correct, right? So I don't know when that's going to happen. But Postgres being very standards driven, if it does happen, I wouldn't be surprised to see if uh, continuous views and streaming analytics become inherent in Postgres itself. That could very well happen. Uh, yeah, and what's cool about uh, Pipeline DB is it does truly enable continuous streaming analytics. It's different than something like Spark and a lot of these other products that do micro batching. Okay? What Spark does is it collects a bunch of data that's coming in and it says, okay, I got 10,000. Now I'm going to run my analytics on it. Okay? It does that, it gets the answer. And then it says, okay, now I'm going to do the next batch. And so it's, it's sort of doing partials and then doing a combination of all those batch results. That's a little bit different than uh, what Pipeline DB is doing, which is actually, it's actually operating continuously. Anytime data comes in, <coughs> a piece of data that is subject to a continuous view is like a trigger. It triggers uh, an update, basically, to the, uh, the values of the view. So, uh, Whereas in, in Spark, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it waits till the data is all collected to a certain threshold and then it processes that all. It's a different approach um, and Spark has its reasons for doing it that way. Um, we've talked about how, you know, they, they get around having to look at the totality of the data uh, because they're handled by those aggregate functions. That's good. Uh, great thing, all the setup and analytics are done in SQL. This is really good because um, it used to be that if you wanted to do like streaming analytics and you've, you've got Kafka, you'd have to do something with Kafka streams. Anybody work with Kafka streams? Yeah, you, know, you got to write that stuff in Java, right? Well, there are not many data analysts out there that do Java. That's just not in their, their resume, right? You generally have data analysts they love SQL, they live in the SQL world, and then you have data scientists, and they love to, to code up in R, Julia, or whatever. They love that kind of stuff. But these people uh, both do valuable work, um, but uh, they live in different worlds, and they certainly use different tools. 
So what's really great about Pipeline DB is that you can leverage their knowledge and offload a lot of uh, streaming analytics work onto them so that they don't come to you and say, hey, would you write this Kafka, Kafka Streams um, uh, data analytics thing for me? You know, you don't want to do that. You want to go out to lunch. You want to go have a martini, right? Uh, so that's really, really good. <clears throat> Anytime you can offload something uh, to people who already have the skill set to do that, that's really a, a really good thing. Um, really good connectivity from everything. Uh, again, small learning curve. Uh, easy Kafka integration is already kind of built in. The, the plumbing's all there. You just kind of set some parameters and boom, it's there. Uh, yeah, direct read-write integration with Vertica, HTFS, Redis, log files. Um, and then, of course, everything with Postgres is there, like uh, data access and security rules. Um, and then the, because they're uh, throwing away data, uh, again, for, that, for the price of the not quite 100% aggregate function results, it can handle very, very high rates of data, which is what you want if you're processing clickstream data because it really gets big. Okay, uh, I was going to make a good point here. Oh, yeah, so we've been talking about using pipeline DB in the context of a stream of data. You can actually use this for other purposes, too. Uh, I'm an old Berkeley guy. When I went to Berkeley, uh, BDS was the new hotness, right? They were developing it there. That's how old I am. Um, but because of that, you know, I, I like Unix and I like little small files and piping everything together. It's really cool. So you could tail a log file. You could pipe that through awk and maybe get the relevant data out of that. And then you could pipe that into pipeline DB as a stream through standard in or whatever. And boom, you got it. You can analyze that. So if you ever go in, to a company or a consultant, and they say, we got a real problem here, Roy, can you help us? You say, well, what you got? Well, we got this problem with our uh, HTTP. So you could just tail that log, and if you've got uh, some aux skills, you know, you can get the stuff that you really want out of that, and then do, do some analytics in Pipeline DB, just like that, nice and easy. And you can carry that around on your laptop. By the way, feel free to interrupt me if you got a question. Uh, Okay, so that's pipeline DB, and I want to talk a little bit now about timescale DB. Uh, but first, a little bit of context. Uh, I've been working with pipeline DB for a couple years, <clears throat> and uh, I got the news on May 1st of this year that pipeline DB had been acquired by Continuant. They're the people behind Kafka. Well, I think Kreps, I think he smells a good deal when he sees it. And he said, we got to get this pipeline stuff into KSQL. I think that's, what they're gonna, that's where they're going to go with it. And so pipeline DB is now semi-moribund. Uh, they're not going to have any more official releases to it. Uh, they're going to open source it, and hopefully the community will pick up on it. I think I might get involved. I'm going to break out my toolkit and uh, see if I can help out a little bit, because it's really a great product, great technology. Uh, but uh, <coughs> I then also found out two weeks ago that uh, this uh, other company, startup, known as Timescale DB, people heard of that? Yeah, it's out there. Um, they have decided uh, to add um, what they call continuous aggregations to their product offering, and they just came out with that two weeks ago. Okay? So the reason that this looks all sloppy is I had to hurry to work this stuff into my presentation. All right? Um, so unlike, it's a little bit different than pipeline DB. I talked about how pipeline wants to emphasize throughput and minimal storage over 100% accurate aggregations. That's their mindset. That's where they've taken it. <clears throat> a little bit different with time scale. They're emphasizing throughput and 100% aggregate results over storage. So they decided, hey, we'll pay the price of, of extra storage within our database because we can go revisit history and get accurate results. We're going to explore that a little bit. I don't have the answers on this, but I just want to plant the seeds in your minds, and maybe you guys can opine what you think about this. Oh, let me just point out the query, how this looks different. Remember how we had continuous view? That's the, the, the relation in um, a pipeline. Here, you create a view. 
Uh, but it's not a continuous view. Instead, you've got this little with uh, helper there. It says with time scale db continuous. See that? That's how you tell it it's a continuous view. Okay, so yeah, I mean, they could probably change the syntax so that it would uh, work with them um, as a continuous view. I, I bet that these will merge at some point because you don't want to have two different syntaxes. It's crazy. And if, if, if continuous view is adopted uh, as a standard uh, in the SQL standard, then I think that the time scale will go that way. Uh, there was a guy here, uh, David Cohn, yesterday, who is from uh, time scale. We had a nice conversation. Unfortunately, he had to head back to New York where they're based, and so he's not. He wanted to be at this talk, but uh, he couldn't make it. Um, but uh, he did sort of confirm that that uh, you know they're very. This is very nascent for them, and they are uh, looking at uh, all these ways to make it better. And implementing continuous view as a syntax for creation maybe is is a direction they'll go in. No guarantees. Yes, sir. Right. Which I'm going to fill with stuff in it. Right. And would I uh, populate it with three search? Can I populate it with copy, like what you said from a table yeah. of someone's log? Or I think the answer to that is all of the above. So anything that puts data in there right. would be happy. And then how, how long does it stay there? Well, that's where they, they keep it forever. Yeah. See, they don't want to get rid of it. And I'm going to show you in the next slide why that is. And you can decide if it's valuable or not. Okay, so at a very high level, I will read this part, okay? A continuous aggregate consists of four parts. A materialization hypertable. That sounds really big, okay? Uh, to store the aggregations, okay? And then there's a materialization engine. It determines, uh, I'm sorry, it um, aggregates the data from the underlying table to the materialization table. Okay, then there's an invalidation engine. This is something that pipeline does not have. It determines when data needs to be rematerialized, and there's a query engine to access the aggregated data. Number three is the inter inter interesting point here because it's an it, it, invalidation um, engine. So, <clears throat> talking to these guys, they didn't like that if data changed, that pipeline DB wouldn't recognize that. Um, so. I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, let's say there's some transaction. Okay, like we've done a running total. Okay, let's hear it. So you collect queries per second data from root DNS servers. Okay. And you store them on the local machine, and some have become inaccessible because network partitions take too long. Right. So three days later, the network's fixed, and I would like to collect that data and add it to my queries per second graph right. from three days ago, which I've already shown to you. Right. Now it's wrong. Right. Because I'm going to add three days ago, three days ago, because now I have it. Right? I didn't have it three days ago. Can I give you a secret from an old country DBA consultant? Just don't tell him. <laughs> Just don't <laughs> tell him. Exactly. <laughs> don't tell him it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes you need to, to redo the data, but if the data is not there, there's no redo, is there? One thing I skipped over when I was showing that pipeline of um, Kafka, Let's see if I got my handy umbrella, which also doubles as my test pipe, okay, demo pipe. Um, there's a concept in Kafka um, which is the width of the history. Now, how long is the data in there? See, people think that um, Kafka is like a messaging bus, but you know what? It's also a historical database because data enters here. It's moving along. Let's say we have record A, and it comes in here. Dun, 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 dun. And then there's an update to it before this one is through. It's A prime. Now you've got two versions of that record, okay? They're both in here. That's a historical database, okay? Usually, by default, Kafka has a seven-day window, okay? That's how long the data lives. And part of the DR strategy that you have is, uh, and if you're doing Kafka at all is, you better be able to restore your data, fix your problems within seven days, because that's what you got. After that, Starfleet's going to pull your command, okay? <laughs> um, so in your case, you may have been able to recover that because it was, in, it was three days, you were saying, and you have a seven-day window. 
In Kafka, <coughs> just to diverge a little bit here, there's an offset associated with each bit of data. So um, if you have a fail, you've kept a record of what your last offset within this pipe is, and you can go back and pick it up from there. Okay? So that's how you know, all the de disaster recovery in Kafka is built off of that offset concept. Okay? You can make that um, data window as, as wide as you want, but there are some performance problems. You need more storage for that to happen. Okay? So at Etsy, we, we settled on seven days because that was kind of the default. We said, well, it ain't broke. So it worked for us. Ta Kafka is very robust. I don't think we had a single massive blowout of Kafka. So uh, it works really, really well. I think there were some other questions around it. Anybody? Was? Yeah. All right. Um, but so, yeah, looking at this graphic right here, you can see that the orange stuff, that's what's already been materialized. Okay, so that exists. There's some permanent storage of that. Then there's data that's come in, and it's living in memory probably. It's not materialized yet. Uh, and generally, the materialization happens at query runtime, because they don't want to continually do this, right? So they'll let that pile up a little bit. It's kind of like a, a micro-batching. Uh, not quite, but... Uh, and then there's new data that's being inserted after that. And so what they're really saying is, well, you know, if I got a problem back in my materialized data, I got to go, go back and do that again. I got I to gotta do a redo. Okay. You may have a, a, a use case where you've got to do that. And, you know, you may have to go back three months or something for your root data, you know, and, and fix that. Um, you know, what if, uh, you've, if you're an online retailer and it turns out that uh, there was a whole bunch of fraudulent sales there and you've got to purge them and then you've got to go, you know, you may have to go back months, you may have to go back years to fix all that stuff. Um, in that case, yeah, um, I would say this, that uh, it might be good to, because you have that data lake also, the enterprise data warehouse, that, remember, by definition, has the totality of the data. So if you need to go back and rebuild something, that's the place to do it, right? You would do it there instead of trying to cobble it back together through your, um, your streaming analytics database, you know. Uh, see, they're not competing against each other, they complement each other. One is for, you know, deep dives in historical data, the totality, uh, from day one, and another is, hey, let's take a look at what's going on in the here and now. That's a big difference. And I think that uh, in a lot of cases, while I appreciate what uh, the uh, timescale people are doing right here, and they may be very correct in what they're doing, uh, that I don't think it obviates the value that something like Pipeline does, because that's also providing a lot of value. Uh, a couple of other things I didn't mention about Pipeline is that it's really good at republishing data. So if you're in a Kafka environment, you set up a stream, uh, and you're getting that data, you're, you're doing a continuous view on that stream, let's use the shop and total count of uh, purchases, and you can then very easily republish that out into the Kafka stream as a new topic. So you may have downstream consumers which are like uh, dashboards that are showing something, and you might uh, use that continuous view, create this very digestible analytic data and then republish it out into uh, Kafka and have that picked up by some other process down the line. They did a really good job of simplifying that. And I like simple. Right. Okay, let's talk quickly about uh, K-SQL uh, right here. Not a radio station. Sounds like it. When I first heard about K-SQL, I said, oh my God, the Kardashians, they're getting into databases. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what happened? I don't know why this thing killed. Oh, there it is. All right. Um, all right, there we are. I think it's my last slide anyway. Um, so what is it? It's, it's Kafka's own native SQL on streams. Like I said earlier, you know, you used to have to do uh, uh, Kafka streams is what they called it. And you write this horrible Java code, all this other crap you had to put in it. You know how bad that is. It's terrible. Um, it's a lot of work to get uh, something that in Pipeline DB you can do in just a few minutes. Uh, so continuing acquired Pipeline DB May 1st, as I said, wither Pipeline DB. What's going to happen when it's an open source project? I hope people contribute to it. I think it's really great, but I wouldn't be surprised since they hired these guys. And it 
may have been more of an aqua hire. This is what happens when you start a company and the engineer guy is the CEO. You know, sometimes it's best to just bite the bullet and as much as you might not like the guy, bring in some really good business person to run the show, you know? Because I think that where they got themselves into a position where they had to be acquired, these guys are brilliant, but I think that they didn't quite make the business work. And uh, in the end, the business has to pay the bills. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if all this pipeline DB goodness makes it into K-SQL, we'll see. But again, the one big thing that we'll be missing is that lack of an ability to join against dimensional data. Because it's not stored in Kafka, it lives elsewhere, right? Uh, and uh, I think that to me, that's a, just a huge, huge thing. Yeah, okay, I can do streaming analytics on basically a lot of anonymous data that's flowing by, okay, but I want more. I want to know context about that data, and I'm not going to get it unless I get to do a join against the dimension stuff, okay? Uh, so we shall see where that all goes. Again, they just got acquired, uh, and uh, it remains to be seen what happens with all these guys. The, you know, there's question marks about K-SQL, question marks about pipeline, question marks about time scale. But where there's not a question mark is the need for this stuff. Because if you work in big data at all, and you haven't gotten your hands dirty yet with uh, streaming analytics, you will, okay? Because they're gonna, they're, yeah, there's always some guy who's like some executive who'll come down and say, I need to know, you know what the response time is of this thing straight away. No delay. <clears throat> and they always put that at the end <clears throat> to emphasize it. And then you say, what is this straight away, no delay? Doesn't this guy know that we've got this loop that goes through um, into our enterprise data warehouse and it takes a day to get that data in there? I can't get this stuff straight away, no delay. Well, you can do it if you've got something like this. You can say, you got a boss and you can set this up and get those answers and make him look like the hero that he knows he is. Okay, that's basically the end. I got time for questions here. Oh, thank you. There must be a question. Well, I have a question. I guess I don't know what's going on. Yeah, so uh, actually the, uh, the timescale guys complained a little bit about this, that it maintains uh, everything in memory, okay? But, as I said uh, a little while ago, you can take the results of a query and store that in a real stored table. And if you want durability on the data, that's what you've got to do. If you want history of the instances of querying, then you'd want to do that, especially with sliding window data. You know, you'd want to you'd want to maintain a, a series of those. Anybody else? Don't tell me that that I I've come and given this presentation, and there must be a question. So just a quick question. Yeah. Oh, because that's just the abstract. Yeah. 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 Um, Funny thing, you know, uh, Dan sent out a, uh, an email yesterday, you know, get your slides uploaded. So I dutifully today, after waking up, decided to, uh, to do that. And then I realized that that wonderful pentabarf system is what it's called. I'm not making that up. It's called pentabarf. It actually did that to me. It forgot my password or whatever, and or maybe that was my problem. But I'm blaming it on that because of that name. Uh, so I have to square that away, and that by the end of this evening, I'll have it uploaded. Okay? okay? Yeah, and um, you can go to pipelinedb.com, I guess, and timescaledb.com and, and uh, read their blog posts. And the documentation on PipelineDB is really good. They have a lot of examples, so you can learn a lot by going there. All right, is that it? Is that really it? Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>